Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News or our monthly housing and economy update with our friend Martin North. Martin, how are you? Yeah, very good, thank you. And uh, looking forward to spring, which is slowly beginning to spring in the UK. We've got to the daffodils out. Um, the snowdrops have been sort of quite uh, prolific this year. But um, no snow so far, so we'll see how the last uh, couple of months of uh, winter and into spring go. But yeah, I'm very good. Very busy, a lot going on, running the um, surveys now in the UK as well as Australia and uh, getting some quite interesting insights. A bit too soon to talk about that, but uh, yeah, always plenty going on. And of course, the broader economic backcloth still continues to confuse. Yeah, and uh, I've been trying to enjoy my first, I guess, full summer without playing too much cricket. Um, so getting out and doing plenty of hiking and whatever in the Australian summer while you're over there in the UK. And I guess in our world, Bitcoin um, and crypto has been heating up um, like a lot of things. And, and some of that's very interesting, which I might talk about a little bit as well. It's slowly becoming a collateral asset. We did a video last night. I might mention some of those things as they tie into your slides. But um, it's interesting to mm, see that no, space. Very good. And I have a target of 25,000 steps a day here in the UK and uh, so far um, uh, achieving that objective. So, uh, you know, a lo lot of lovely walks around here with the dogs. So. Great to hear. I thought you were going to say a target of 25,000 for Bitcoin, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, that's all right. Hopefully onwards and upwards, but let's uh, jump into these great slides of yours. So first up, we had CPI come in a little bit higher than expected last night. Yeah, so this is from the US and, um, you know, it continues the message of uh, of higher rates for longer. So we had the Federal Reserve came out, uh, you know, in, in um, January and saying, look, we're not prepared to cut rates yet. We need to see more evidence, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a consistent theme now from most central bankers to say we, we don't see enough yet to actually be able to say we can cut rates, right, which will different from the markets, dramatically different from what the markets thought. So markets originally in the U US were thinking March, and even in Australia, they were thinking sort of maybe June. But um, the CPI data that came out uh, uh, yesterday from the US, whilst it was a little bit improved, there was also not anything close to what people expected. And so the markets dropped quite considerably. They've sort of recovered a little bit. But what's really interesting is that the core consumer price which is the one that the fed really wants to look at right um they thought it was going to be 3.7 it was actually 3.9 percent which is up and very importantly you can see that things like shelter uh is still there so you know the the, the rent sector but the movement particularly in the services sector as we'll see in a second was considerably not where they expected so this is a an archetypal moment, I think, where markets are now saying, oh, hang on a moment, maybe we won't get those rate cuts till significantly later, which means higher for longer, which means, of course, higher mortgage rates. Yeah, and um, the other thing we normally look at as well from time to time is that true inflation data. So that's remained relatively low if we are to believe the way that they conduct their surveys and, and um, data gathering, still at about 1.4% where it's been for a, a few weeks now. So we'll see if that that comes true, but um, I think you're in the camp that we're going to see a little bit, a little bit higher for longer than that. Well, th there's a couple of other factors. If you go onto the second slide, you can see there that services is where the issue is at the moment, right? So services is because, of course, it's all to do with wages, and uh, you know, wage growth in the US, UK is pretty strong. Not so strong in Australia, but you know, stronger than it was perhaps. Um, those services costs then flow through to higher costs plus of course insurance costs dramatically high 18 to 20 percent higher in australia over the last year uh, and that's because of the costs of replacing things when um you know they're stolen or for example when buildings are damaged and of course we've had a lot of um construction damage because of the uh, the storms i'm thinking of you know victoria over the last 24 hours um uh, as an example so services inflation is still the one to watch but goods inflation has been where the benefits have come through so basically we had very high goods inflation and then because of the base effects those dropped out so goods inflation fell but if you think of things like the red sea now blocked off and also of course the panama canal blocked off shipping costs are rising again and supply chain disruptions are starting to, uh, a horrible uh, 
headline yesterday in the UK was that um, uh, tea is being disrupted because it can't be delivered via the rail. <laughs> it's got to go round. So there's a there's a tea shortage in the UK. Can you believe it? So you know it may well be that we're going to see some of these goods. Uh, inflation numbers go the wrong way too. So, like I say, I don't think the battle with inflation is actually um, over yet. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, I guess we can say that this is also very um, relevant to what's happening in inflation in stock markets and, and that type of thing. And I might um, add my two cents in a little bit, but what are your thoughts on the S&P 500 breaking 5,000? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of headlines into last week and into this week, uh, all-time highs, and it's come back slightly now, but... Um, the thing to understand here is that um, this is a very narrow peak. It's thanks to what I call the Magnificent Six, because I've got to take Tesla off the list at the moment, right? So, you know, we're, we're talking about those few big tech stocks, thanks to AI. It's really, really narrowly based. And if you think, in fact, if you look at it differently, so there's another index called the Equal Weight. So the Equal Weight Index essentially puts all the stocks in the index on an equal footing. And there you see that we we haven't hit another new high. Compare that with the S&P 500, which is um, you know seasonally up, and that's because close on 30% of the S&P 500 is those magnificent six stocks, and some of those have of course done very very well. But you know Tesla, if you look at the next slide, you know, yeah. Tesla's down, and, and so some people are saying, well, you know, are we playing out again the dot com bubble? You know, are we actually overhyping? the value of those AI stocks. Now, they're big companies and they're well managed and there's some very exciting developments in AI. But is this really what they're worth? Because frankly, some of the valuations are sky high. And, you know, whilst Tesla's dropped back dramatically, you know, it shows you that not all of the Magnificent Seven are in the same boat. Um, you know, the, the other ones, if you look on the next slide, shows that they're at sky high levels. But those multiples, and you know, we look at NVIDIA or Microsoft, those multiples are way higher than they should be, I think. So there's a real risk that if the economy doesn't sort of muddle through the way that people expect, and if in fact the value of those big stocks are actually over um, inflated, could we see a correction? And, um, you know, the chances are we could. And then, of course, um, uh, small caps, if you look at the next slide with the Russell 2000, they're not feeling the love at all. So, so this is a peak which is very narrowly based and is on a bit of a precipice. And I think that uh, we wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see stocks come back 10, 15% because of the fact that it's not broad. That higher inflation number, of course, another negative indicator. And of course, interest rates higher for longer, which means that bond rates are higher for longer, which means that funding for companies are higher for longer. That could be a bit of a drag. Yeah, I think with um, the tech stocks and AI, I think the demand for chips and computing power is still pretty real. So I, I expect that to remain strong as long as the world continues to go more um, digital and need more computing power in general. I think with the small caps, it's a lot of parallels there to what's going on in small business. It's just so hard to run a small business and it's so easy for these super companies sitting on piles of cash. As you say, they don't have to worry too much about um borrowing and that there are it's the same as the wealthy versus the the lower class you know they're almost making money on their wealth with these higher interest rates and during tougher tougher times and they can come along and buy buy out these smaller companies and whatnot so i guess it's just another point to drive home that our financial system is built um, to perpetually drive inequality really yeah and of course global debt has never been higher you know it continues to climb um that debt now is costing a lot more not everybody is equally um, impacted by that, whether you look at governments, whether you look at corporates, or whether you look at individuals. But if you are in the situation where you have a lot of debt and you need to resurface it um, with higher rates at the moment, uh, and you know we're seeing that with fixed rate mortgages still rolling over in Australia, there's about another 20% of fixed rates to sort of come off over the next little while. Or yeah. um, corporates who are actually, um, you know, frankly struggling with all of this um all this debt laden um debt that they've got and uh, the, the the broader issue of course also is that many small corporations and small businesses have huge administrative costs thanks to the inefficiency of you know in australia gst and all those things so um we've got a situation where if you are a small business or a smaller corporate the gradient's really really tough but for a small proportion of those corporates, they're doing really well. And you could say exactly the same in um, in consumer land as well. So CBA came out and showed that, uh, you know, people who were um, um, older, you know, 60s plus, were still saving 
significantly more savings rather than less and mm. buying more investment properties rather than less but younger people completely different story so we've got this huge inequality built into the system and i don't think anybody wants to tackle it but you know we should call it out because it's a really big issue yeah absolutely um all right so it's a little bit different over in asian markets <laughs> well it's a tale of two asias right so if you look at japan for example so in japan the um you know, um, the Nikkei 225 reached huge highs and uh, they're still saying they're going to keep interest rates relatively low, although the uh, the new governor there was saying, well, maybe we'll, you know, move it slightly. But, you know, the Japanese stock market is very strong and um, inflation in Japan is, well, you know, it's 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 there or thereabouts. It's coming down a little, but um, so so that's one end of the spectrum. But China is the other end of the spectrum where you've got disinflation now in spades, where you've got um, the Chinese government continuing to throw more stimulus at various parts of the economy. We had, of course, Evergrande, that little uh, inset at the top there, uh, Evergrande stock um, now, um, of course, frozen. But uh, the property sector, which was 30% of the economy, continued to languish. And the big question as to whether China will do more, whether it won't, what it and what it's actually doing is trying to prop up some of the property sector they've lowered the ratios on some of the banks to allow them to lend more and they've done a few other things too but the question is it doesn't need to be working so you've got you know the second biggest economy in the world looking uh, pretty sick and by the way india which is you know a completely different situation again all time highs and, and growing quite fast so for me what shows this shows me that the massive differences in different economies and, uh, you know, China pulling in one direction, the U.S. pulling in the other direction. The other interesting observation is, of course, that China and the U.S. have a strong interconnection. But the investment in China from outside of China is continuing to drift lower, whereas, in fact, um, China's pulling back its horns in some of the international investment. So, so again, it's, it's sort of creating, I think, a further decoupling of, of the global economy, which is uh, not necessarily going to help anyone. Maybe China needs to take on the uh, aggressive immigration policies of some of these Western countries to fill those ghost cities that they've been building the past few years, Martin. <laughs> well, they've got certainly uh, plenty of ghost cities, plenty of half-finished uh, half finished buildings. There's enough in the pipeline of, on, on the construction side to keep the construction industry in China running for the next couple of years. But, of course, the question is what happens then because they're not really selling anything like the same number of new um, developments and of course in China um, if you're a homeowner and you want to buy a property you have to pay for it up front before it gets started so what that means is that as that um, drifts forward they might complete the ones that they're actually building if they can get the materials at a reasonable price but what happens after that that could mean the demand for steel comes down and if demand for steel comes down that could actually put pressure on commodities and of course, Australia is highly connected to what happens in China with regard, for example, to steel, because steel prices have actually you know, stayed quite high. So there's an interesting question in the medium term as to what the fallout could be. I don't think that this time around we're going to see massive stimulus in China. I think they've got a different doctrine now in play, which means, of course, we may see more difficulty for quite some time. And, um, you know, there is also quite a lot of Chinese money that's still coming out of China. And... Um, some of that's ending up in Australia and uh, ending up in Australian property directly. So uh, some of these fallouts could be quite significant locally as well as internationally. Yep. Okay, so the RBA is um, on a bullish hold at the moment too. <laughs> yeah, so of course we had the first um, um, uh, press conference uh, of the new series, as it were, when uh, Michelle Bullock um, you know, delivered the, uh, the, the news. And uh, then she on Friday, uh, I think it was Thursday or Friday last week, was uh, in front of the uh, the House uh, Economics Committee and basically saying, well, you know, inflation could be still a problem. We may have to lift rates. We're certainly not even prepared to cut rates yet. They're not thinking that the uh, target will be hit for inflation until you know 2025. And um, of course, uh, <clears throat> tomorrow she will be uh, in front of the Senate as well for one of their uh, reviews. That'll be quite interesting. The Senate tends to be a bit more um, um, open with some of their questions, so I'll be covering that too. But to my mind, whilst there were press conferences um, this time around, frankly, the quality of the questions from the uh, journals was was remarkably low. 
very little in terms of additional insight. And uh, the statement on monetary policy, which came out in line with the meeting, also said, higher for longer, expect unemployment to rise. Um, you know, <clears throat> the economy is doing okay, but not great. And uh, they sort of tweaked down the growth rates and things like that. So to my mind, um, we've got um, the RBA trying, hopefully, to talk the economy into a good place. But again, the markets who were expecting rate cuts quite soon are now kicking those further out. The bond yield went up slightly, and that means that mortgage rates will be higher for longer in Australia. And, uh, you know, there are consequences of that, as you'll, as we'll see in a moment or two. Yeah. Uh, okay, so consumers um, dipped a little bit in the confidence. So it's interesting. So the um, Melbourne Institute Westpac Confidence Index came out just slightly higher, whereas the Roy Morgan one, which was slightly more frequent, dropped a little. And you can still see it's well into territory that, you know, well, we didn't really see for a long, long time. You know, it's sort of just slightly above um, the worst of COVID. Uh, and so my argument is that um, there was an expectation amongst consumers that rates cuts would start quite soon. And that's when the Melbourne Institute did theirs. But the, uh, then the RBA came out with their story and then um, Roy Morgan's uh, survey came out and we've seen it come down again. So I would say that consumers have blinked, that their con confidence levels are pretty low, that for many people, the costs of the mortgage and the costs of just getting around and doing ordinary things continues to be a problem. And as we'll see later, um, there was a report that came out that suggested that some of the inflationary pressures in Australia are more than just, you know, importing it. There's local problems going on. And in fact, Michelle Bullock did actually say that a lot of the inflation in Australia is now homegrown. And I think um, many, many people would actually uh, agree with that. And uh, so I think weak consumers is an issue. But of course, this is an average. And come back to my other point, not all consumers are in the same boat. So you've got some that are actually um, saving well, they've got uh, big increases in terms of income, their costs are fine, and they will spend and they're still buying investment properties and, uh, you know, lots of headlines that those property markets back. Um, but you've got another bunch of people who are in the rental sector and 70 something percent of those are actually struggling with cash flow according to my surveys and then in the mortgage sector about 50 percent of those with mortgages are struggling with cash flow as well so again you've got this disparate story but overall at an aggregate level consumers are actually on the blink and that means they're spending less and in fact in real terms spending a lot less than they were which puts downward pressure on the economic activity and uh, makes it more difficult for some sectors of the economy and in, you know some of the recent reporting that came out from some of the big guys uh, in the retail sector suggested that it's really tough and they're having to discount deeply to try and get people to buy so yeah. i'm afraid that the story is going to be difficult for some time we might touch on that again uh, in a couple of slides but um the next up we've got the oz mortgage rates being um, relatively high compared to these other countries yeah, I thought this was just quite interesting because uh, it shows you that, um, you know, a, a lot of things are going on here. Um, part of it is, of course, we've got um, a lot of that variable rate mortgage stuff now uh, coming back, people going off fixed rates. But the average weighted mortgage rate in Australia, it's pretty much at the top of the the tree when it comes to some of the comparisons, right? Um, compared with the UK or, or, or the US. Now, the US has 30-year fixed mortgages. In the UK, there are still quite a lot of long-term fixed mortgages in, in, in the system. We don't have the same long-term fixed in Australia. I think we probably should. Um, but that would then put more risks on the banks rather than actually on consumers. Um, so that probably won't happen. Um, but it is worth just underscoring that we're talking here an average mortgage rate of, you know, around 6% plus or minus. And um, if you go back a couple of years, we were talking at um, you know, 3%. So that significant impost on households, particularly in Australia, because of the variable rate um, structure of our, of our system and, the frank, frankly, the uh, market not being very competitive, um, although, of course, the banks say, oh, it's highly competitive. Well, no, it's not really. Um, they're all on the, same, um, on the same ship, as it were. So it means a lot of households are paying a lot more. And uh, that pulls economic activity out of the out of the system yeah all right next up um we've got national house prices yeah i thought we'd just touch on this uh, briefly because of course the uh, the headline was oh house prices are um you know buoyant well yeah look carefully so melbourne they're still falling um sydney they're up a little the truth is that it's really queensland and western australia where all the positive momentum is on the other hand 
uh, in Tasmania, for example, prices are still falling in some areas. And so these aggregate price measures that everybody sort of spends a lot of time talking about don't really tell you very much at all. So I thought I'd just quickly show you better, more granular data. This is from CoreLogic. If we go to the next slide, right, because this is really interesting. So this is, um, we'll start with Melbourne. So this is the movement in home values over the last three months. And you can see here in Melbourne, there are a number of areas where prices are down between three and 6% or more. There are a couple of areas where they're going up, but you can see here that it's not uniform across across the whole of Melbourne. And that's the key point, granularity, right? Or if you look at uh, another one, so if we go to Brisbane, you can see there, there's a lot of um, momentum, but it's not equally spread again. So there are some significant momentum in around Brisbane and to the south of Brisbane. But if you go um, you know, further to the west, it's a completely different story. Um, so again, it's very important to understand that these high level um, indicators don't tell the full story. And if you go to Perth, um, even in Perth, where, of course, everyone's saying, oh, Perth is a massively buoyant market. Well, it sort of is and isn't. If you look in some areas over the last three months, it, particularly in around the centre of Perth, prices have actually been relatively stable or slightly higher, whereas in other areas, they're up quite a lot more. And, uh, you know, that sort of makes a, a pretty important point about the fact that it is very, very different in different locations. And even in different suburbs in the same region, you get different outcomes. So these high level indicators don't tell you much. And the final chart, which I just want to focus on rents, rents are absolutely astonishingly higher. So this is actually 12 months rent for, I picked Sydney just to show the um, dramatic differences. So you can see there that in and around the center of Sydney, rents are higher by 20%. Uh, if you come out slightly it's 15 to 20%, you have to go way, 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 way out to see very small rent increases. So what that means is if you want to find somewhere to rent, you either pay through the nose close in, or you actually go way, way out with all the travel costs and everything else. So that's really the problem. The rental sector is broken, driven, of course, by higher migration, as we've discussed previously, driven also by the fact that we don't have enough supply. And um, interestingly, of course, in Melbourne, a lot of the properties that are actually being listed at the moment are ex-rental properties because they can't make it can't make it work, economics don't work anymore. And uh, that's a really important point. So we've got a significant one third of households who are in the rental sector, of which about two thirds of them are really struggling. And that's a big economic drag on the economy. Yeah, we've spoken about this um, before in detail, but I guess it's an, just another layer of how when you've only got these two levers you can pull as, as a central bank, if governments aren't going to radically change policy, jacking up interest rates, again, the homeowners are just jacking up the rents and banks even contact them to say, hey, you know, these repayments are going to go up. We recommend you increase your rent and that type of thing. So it's it's just this system that's built to um, squeeze that that lower and um, you know even middle class to some, some degree there. Well, that's right. And it's interesting that um, CBA's results um, said we're seeing an uptick in delinquencies, not a massive uptick, but remember that this is after the support that's been provided by all the banks for a lot of people are being given extended loans over longer term periods interest only rather than principal and interest loans and uh, you know even interest holiday um, payments so that they can actually get by but even after that we're still seeing higher delinquencies and so the the forward view that i've got is that we are going to see higher delinquencies because rates are going to be higher for longer as i said thanks to the, to the rba and um, that's going to put an impost on um, on banks and their ability to lend. Um, they're still very keen to lend, of course, because it's the only game in town, but it's not equally spread across uh, all households. And uh, so it's a bit of a mess. And uh, as you say, the RBA has interest rates as the lever. But with the inflation not coming down in line with what people were expecting, we would expect to see the inflation rate staying high, which means interest rates will stay high, which means that all these knock-on effects um, are going to be a problem. And we'll talk about that. In fact, one of the interesting observations is that, um, you know, to what extent do politicians want to disrupt the system? And on the next slide, there's a really interesting little bit of research that says that two thirds of federal parliamentarians have two or more properties, um, according to declared interest. So they have an interest in keeping property prices high and, uh, you know, keeping the negative gearing going, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a housing crisis, but do they really want to tackle it? Um, because obviously one of the big questions is if you keep property prices high, then their investments are fine. If you see property prices begin to fall, 
that has an impact on their own in situation. So to what extent can politicians um, really isolate themselves from their own interests? Yeah, and sort of um, on a similar vein of thought there, I was reading about the um, amount of interest that the government is charging and profiting on hex debt. So if the gov- oh, if the yes. bond rate or the natural interest rates four percent, they're charging hex at seven percent. So they're making three percent on eighty billion dollars of hex debt. So what's that? Two or three, two or three billion dollars a year, basically off students that are new to the workforce, um, to to sort of fund education again from the people that need it most or need a need a break the most when the cost of living is up. As these sort of things, I think, should be no brainers um, when. To, to, just to change to make the system, I guess, fairer. Well, of course, the young youngsters who've been through university and have those hex decks are the very people trying to save for a deposit to get a house, and the very people who are having to, um, you know, pay for the nose through mortgages in the mean, uh, mortgages or, or or rent in the meantime. So it, it, it's a really big structural issue, and I I don't think politicians really want to recognise just how big. The housing crisis is, and in fact, the next slide, um, I just put up this um, little piece of information. This is from um, from IPA.org that said new research released from IPA estimates the federal government's unplanned rise in net overseas migration to over 1.75 million by 2028 will create a housing shortage of 252,000 dwellings in the same period. So migration is is a is a, is a really really big part of the story here, and uh, of course population.org that they use so, big australia equals housing crisis and they should have showed the tent city there so migration is part of the question and of course the government's claim that they're doing things about migration but really they're not doing much at all and uh, they still want to bring more people into the country at a time when we can't house the people we've got here it doesn't make a lot of sense um but on the other hand you know you look at uh, what the mainstream are saying well the mainstream don't want to recognize the problem the mainstream are on the ha- on the other hand saying oh no everything's fine auction clearance rates surge you know signs point in the right direction and uh, you know ray white says um it's looking pretty good as clearance rates pretty high the property market is in trouble but there are a lot of property investors and a lot of international migrants coming in who can still afford to buy locals in australia can't and a lot of youngsters can't afford to get into the market, which is completely distorting the market even further. But the politicians really don't want to talk about this. They want to talk about, oh, it's a supply problem. We'll just um, build more high rise, if it's <laughs> even if it's cheap and it falls down quite quickly. I mean, structurally, we're a long way off tackling the, the, the root causes, in my view. Yeah, and just I want to quickly touch on something you mentioned um, in one of our Bitcoin videos we did last night about how there's 8.8 trillion cash piles on the sidelines still in the US in terms of the stock market. And then I think we've also mm. got the figure was 18 trillion um, you know, US households holding onto. So when you think about the number of you know those lower bands, lower, lower middle class that are struggling, there's still so much wealth for those um, people to swoop in. Like you said, politicians will be included in, in that group. And so they're happy to cheer when property goes up, but it's really kind of that underlying, well, what does that really mean for the majority of people? And it's kind of crazy now that we do live in this world where um, the majority of voters would probably want things differently, but it's so hard to bring about any change because the politicians' views no longer reflect the true interests of the people because of lobbying and um, their own personal interests and all the things that we always talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the interests of the politicians are also aligned very largely with big corporates. So if you take the banks, who are some of the most powerful lobbyists in the country, uh, and what they want, um, or if you look at some of the other sectors, you know the gas corporates and, and those things, you know. So, so what you've got is you've got the political class very strongly aligned with the big corporates, but they are over against ordinary, ordinary Australians or you know mm. or, or ordinary citizens who are trying to get by, and it shows you that the system is actually not well structured to benefit ordinary Australians into the future. So you yeah. know people make decisions. For to support the corporates, et cetera, et cetera, but not actually to support ordinary Australians. Until that changes, I don't think we're going to get any radical reform, which I think is, you know, frankly is required because the system over the last 30 years has actually failed most Australians. Yeah, I guess that probably leads into this next slide you've got here about Coles and Woolies and a lot of the um, you know airlines, all these different sectors we have with the monopolies or duopolies, whatnot, and um, 
I guess just for me personally, this is kind of why I'm passionate about crypto. It's a system trying to build something at least a bit different, decentralized, decentralizing power. So users and um, own these networks or own these companies or own the protocol. So it truly reflects and gets rid of that hierarchical structure. Um, you know, typically we see in corporations and government and everything these days. So what are your sort of thoughts on um, what's happening in the corporate world, Martin? So it's very interesting, this uh, report by... Professor Alan Fells, of course, ex from the ACCC, um, was done for the Australian Council of Trade Unions, but they went through and said, let's look at it sector by sector by sector. And, you know, clearly prices have gone up over the last few years. But what's driving it? And they basically concluded there was a set of common practices that most corporations in most sectors, not every corporate, but a lot of corporates were actually running into where they were actually gouging. So, you know, inflation was X, but they actually put their prices up X plus quite a lot. And they quoted Qantas, for example, as one example in the airline industry. And they quoted the banks who are still making a, a mozza, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and their conclusion was wherever you look, wherever you look, ordinary Australians are being gouged by the bad behavior of corporates. Um, despite, of course, reaping record profits. Yes. And um, the, the question is, and you know, they, they pose the question, how are we going to change this? And they, he's made a number of very important suggestions, which would be politically untenable, probably for those in, you know, in, in Canberra at the moment. But unless things change, it means that households and small businesses end up paying through the nose. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> it also drives inflation higher than it should, which is means that interest rates have to be higher than they should be, which means that more people have to pay more for their mortgages. So to my mind, this is beginning to pick at a really un, uh, really important issue. And, you know, that, that thread could unwind quite interestingly and significantly if politicians take it seriously. But of course, like I said earlier on, maybe they've got enough vested interest to um, look the other way. But for me, this was a really important report. And if you've not read it, I really recommend uh, going across and uh, getting a copy of it. It's, it's a really insightful um, piece. Yeah, so I guess, um, again, negative gearing, a similar thing to what we've mentioned with everything. Is it going to be too unpopular to push through? And um, maybe maybe it will. But I guess with all of this, I guess I would say if, if nothing does change, then we start to see um, the election of more radical um, you know, politicians and people that put their hand up in different parties, as we've, as we've seen across other countries already. And people tend to rise up and we see you know, more unlawful behavior and protests and people get to the point where they're completely fed up with the politicians and the corruption and um, corporates mm. not being fair on the general populace. Well, it, it does tell you about the state of the times, you know. So Albo did a, a, a flip on the um, stage three tax and got a bounce in the polls for doing it. And by the way, the evidence looks as though Treasury actually recommended this strategy um, to uh, Albo um, as a way of um, re configuring the um, stage three tax cuts without adding extra inflation. We'll see about that. But then, of course, the the discussion switched to specifically negative gearing, but also the um, 50% capital gains relief for investors, property investors. And um, the Greens are now starting to push quite hard on this, saying, well, hang on a moment, you know, you've got this housing policy that you want us to vote in, but it's only going to impact a very small number of people so what about tackling some of these big picture issues which of course a couple of elections ago labor actually campaigned for changes to negative gearing and changes to the um uh, you know the tax system to be able to actually deal with a 50 percent um, capital gains and these are big numbers you know the treasury um recently put some numbers out that showed just these were big quantum so in other words taxpayers are supporting property investors mm -hmm. and taxpayers are given up a very large amount of money because of the capital gains 50% rule. And they showed some distributional um, benefit uh, data as well, which showed that basically high income earners benefited most from both the negative gearing and also from the 50% capital gains rule. So it was not equally spread. So the benefits were like this. You as an ordinary taxpayer are paying your taxes and a lot of that money then ends up going back to a small proportion of high income earners in Australia. And I guess the question is, is that equitable? Is it fair? And will the government do anything about it? Or will, like I said earlier on, will their own interests get in the way? Uh, will the Greens be successful? Not sure. 
But to me, it just, again, cast another spotlight on just how poorly um, our um, economy is being governed at the moment and how badly it's distorted. And, um, you know, the, the powers of big business and the, the power of big, uh, of, of big government um, against ordinary Australians. So then something needs to change. And as you say, if, in fact, we don't get changed through, um, you know, the, the normal political process, because you'd argue, I think, that both sides of politics are very close on many issues, then what do you do? Well, you know, do you actually try and create a, a third force or, you know, what, what else happens? Otherwise, the system just grinds on and um, people get taken to the cleaners again. Yeah, what's the JFK uh, quote, Martin? Um, uh, those that make uh, peaceful uh, resolution impossible may will make violent revolution inevitable, something like that. So, yeah. Spot on. And, uh, of course, that then, that, that then suggests that you know, you, well, you look outside the system, which, of course, is precisely where the um, the crypto, um, you know, language starts to come in. Because, well, if if, if you believe that the uh, the system is biased against you, then you look for an alternative system. Yes, don't don't complain about it. Build a new one, which is what people are trying to do in our world. Whether or not it works, we'll uh, we'll have to wait and see. But as always, guys, if you have got any comments, we love reading those on any of the topics and slides we've um, covered today. I'll have the links to all. Uh, Martin's content down below where he does regular uh, videos on all this stuff um, and we'll continue to do our crypto videos and crypto research as well but thanks a lot um, for joining us hit that like button subscribe and uh, Martin will do it all again next month yeah look forward to that see you take care bye bye thanks guys